My great pleasure to invite a speaker here today, Piotr Ailash, which is from Universe of Baseball. Piotr did plenty of research about behavior of species on the metric species that is floating within a sort of like a climate. And today he's going to be talking about topologically non trivial contact samples to SARS students. And one of the things after this talk, we would like to go with him for dinner. If you want to join us, let me know after the talk. Yes. Okay. So I would like to thank uh, for inviting me to give a call. I think that's a great honor for me. And this is my second visit to the Ohio State University. The first time was several years ago. I was invited here by Vladimir Mazia. So my research area is just, I would say, classical analysis and quantitative topology, that will explain what it means. Classical analysis, so I work with Sobolev spaces, classical Sobolev spaces, a little bit with harmonic analysis, but also Sobolev mappings between manifolds, and uh, <clears throat> I work with uh, analysis on metric spaces, in particular with Sobolev spaces on metric spaces, and with quantitative topology, which I mean topology of metric spaces, but where we look at <clears throat> not just continuous mappings, but for example, Lipschitz mappings, and see how they uh, behave. And uh, I'm also interested in the geometry of the Heisenberg group, so, which is a basic now. Okay, but today I will talk about uh, topological, about the counterexamples to the classical sub theorem, but with some topological constraints. So, Oh. Yes, but that uh, 118 pages in PDF I doesn't mean 118 slides, right? So, well, so my talk is based on two joint papers, one with Pavel Goldstein at Kapanka, and the other one with Pavel Goldstein. So, uh, okay, <clears throat> the classical SART theorem. So when we consider mappings of class C1 from between Euclidean spaces going from a larger dimension to the dimension which is less than or equal to M. And the critical points are those points where the rank of the derivative is not maximal. It's less than the dimension of the target space. So the <clears throat> critical values are just points in the image of the critical set. And everything else is the set of regular values. So, what does it mean to be a regular value? If we have a regular value, then at every point of the pre-image, uh, the rank of the derivative equals n, and then we can apply the classical implicit function theorem to conclude that the pre-image of every uh, regular value is uh, a nice uh, submanifold of dimension n minus n. So, critical values are bad. We don't want them and regular values are nice, and we want the set of critical values to be small. And actually, this is a celebrated result of the Sard, who proved that when uh, the mapping is sufficiently regular, so when the smoothness of the mapping is larger than the difference of the dimension, then the set of critical values is measure zero, which means almost every point in our n is a regular value, and for almost every point, the pre image of this point is a submanifold. In particular, if we look at the mappings between cubes, C2 mappings between cubes, right, the, the difference in dimension of the cube is 1, so 2 is larger than 1. In that case, if we ask, consider mapping such that the rank of the derivative is less than n everywhere, that means every point is critical, okay? So every point is critical, and according to the Sartre theorem, the image of the entire cube must have measure zero. So the mapping cannot be subject, as simple as that. But what happens 
if uh, instead of regularity C2, we consider regularity C1. In that case, the smoothness is equal to the difference of dimensions, and the uh, SAR theorem doesn't apply. And there is a very beautiful counterexample due to Kaufman. So for each n, greater or equal to, one can construct a surjective mapping of class C1, so that at every point, the rank of the derivative equals 1 or 0. So when the rank is 0, that means just the total derivative is 0. So that's a very surprising result, because when, they, when you have this condition and at the point, the rank of the derivative is 1, then in the neighborhood it has to be 1. And from the rank theorem, it follows that in the neighborhood of the point, uh, the mapping is just a curve. So such a mapping should be like, like a curve, C1 curve. So how can it be subjective? Well, it's a curve, but it, this curve can branch at points where the derivative is 0. And this can, strange things can happen. OK. So now, this example can be also uh, modified, and one can look at mappings from n plus 1 dimensional sphere to n dimensional sphere. Right? So one can construct a mapping of class C1 from n plus 1 dimensional sphere to n dimensional sphere, surjective mapping, with this property. Right? One can construct. So in that case, look that this is a counterexample to the SAR theorem because uh, the whole image is critical and has positive measure because the whole cube is critical. So now, if n is set to two, then this homotopy group of the sphere as n is non-trivial. That's a classical example. What does it mean? We can find a mapping from n plus one dimensional sphere to n dimensional sphere, which is not homotopic to a constant one. And we can ask the following question, whether it is possible to construct a Kaufman type example with this condition and a mapping which is not homotopic to a constant one. What uh, follows from construction is that clearly we can construct a mapping fr uh, from the sphere n plus 1 dimensional to n dimensional, which is surjective. But the question is whether we can construct such a mapping which is not homotopic to a constant one. Well, and, and instead of looking at the rank less than or equal 1, let's be uh, more flexible and allow rank to be just less than n. But even in this case, when the rank is less than n, then all points are critical, right? Because uh, it's less than the dimension of the curve. All points are critical. Okay, so that's a question. And, okay, in the case in which we have a mapping of class C2, okay, then rank of, and the rank of the derivative is less than n, then all points are critical. So the all image of the mapping is critical, and according to the SAR theorem, the image has measure zero. So the mapping is not surjective. If we have a mapping uh, into the sphere which is not surjective, then the mapping is homotopic to a constant map, because we have a sphere, right? We have a sphere, Sn, and it's not surjective, so there is some hole which is not covered. And then we just can take this hole and along the meridian squeeze everything to the soft pole. So if the mapping is not, uh, not surjective, that is homotopic to a constant map. That, that's trivial. So in this case, such a mapping. So the question is whether one can find uh, whether uh, in the case of C1 mappings, one can find such a mapping which is not homotopic to a constant. Now, this is actually a question of Larry Goof, who asks, we don't know any homotopically non-trivial C1 mappings between spheres with rank less than n. Does one exist? Uh, so, this, he asked this question in that paper, and the results of Larry Goof that I will quote are from this paper. So let's look at the Kaufman construction, because maybe the Kaufman construction does give an example. Okay? But Kaufman mapping is a, a, at the point where the rank of the derivative equals 1, the mapping is a curve. 
So uh, the mapping constructed by Kaufman is actually a uniform limit into, uh, of mappings into finite trees. So at each, so this is a sequence so the image looks more or less like this. Each sequence looks like that. And then the next element in the sequence has more branches. And then more branches. And those branches get dense, uh, more and more dense. Eventually, they cover the whole sphere. However, at each step, mapping into such a tree is contractible because the tree is contractible. And if the mappings are contractible, then their uniform limit is contractible. This is such a long paper. It's a long paper. It's a long paper. So, okay. So, Kaufman construction gives only homotopy trivial maps. And so, we need a new idea. So, is it possible? So, let's uh, repeat this question. So, we are interested in looking at such maps. So, okay. The following result is relatively easy to prove, that when n equals 2, and we are looking at metrics from three-dimensional sphere to two-dimensional sphere, <laughs> with rank uh, of the derivative less than 2, right? so less than n, in this case n equals 2, then mapping must be homotopy trivial. In this case, the result is not very particularly difficult, because we can characterize mappings which are not homotopic to a constant map which will by the hop invariant. Okay, so let me sketch the proof. So a mapping from the three-dimensional sphere to two-dimensional sphere is homotopic to a constant map if and only if the hop invariant equals zero. So what is the hop invariant? How do we define this? So the construction of the hop invariant is as follows. So you, we have a mapping, then we take a volume form on the two-dimensional sphere. We take a pullback of this form. Volume form is closed. So the pullback is closed. And that's a standard result that every closed two form on S3 is exact. Because the second cohomology group of S3 is, is zero. So this is exact. So we can represent this as the exterior derivative of some one form. And then the Hopf invariant is given by this integral. So that's a white cut way of defining hop invariant. So what does it mean invariant? It means that mappings which are homotopic have the same hop invariant. Okay, and then there's a theorem which says that mappings uh, from S3 to S2 are homotopic to a constant map if and only if the hop invariant is zero. Okay, and now what we have, if we have a mapping uh, with the rank of the derivative less than two, then the pullback of the volume form is zero. Why? Because how do we define the pullback of the form? The coefficients of the pullback, if you look at the local coordinate system, the coefficients of the pullback are made of two by two minors of the derivative. And since the rank of the derivative is less than two, all the minor two by two minors are zero. So it's it's just from the definition of the pullback. Well, if we take omega equals zero, then the omega is equal to f star alpha because f star alpha is zero. And then Hopf invariant be zero wedge d zero, which is zero, and it's homotopic to constant map. Actually, this proof is wrong. It's almost correct because there is a tiny problem with this proof. So here I, I say that we have the, the C one mapping, and then the pullback of, of a volume form is closed. Well, uh, how do we define the pullback of a form? Uh, the coefficients of the pullback are made of derivatives of f. Okay? So coefficients of the pullback, if the mapping is one, are just continuous. So this is a form which is continuous. So what does it mean is closed? So we cannot differentiate this form, right? Because the, it's continuous form. So then we can actually talk about weakly closed and weakly uh, um, uh, exact forms in the sense of distributions. And we can make this argument rigorous. So using the LP, actually L2 Hodge decomposition and sober of spaces. So this is some technicality, quite a lot of technicalities, but this is a standard argument. This is kind of standard argument. 
So this result has been known for a quite a, a long time. Okay, so this re result has been known, but in the next dimension, when we look at the mappings from S4 to S3 with Frank of the derivative less than three, then such mappings uh, are also necessarily homotopic to a constant. And that's a very difficult result. So this was one of the results proven in this 100 pages long paper by, by Larry Goff. It was not, uh, I mean, the proof of this result was not that long because the paper contains a lot of other material, but it's very difficult. And he was using the uh, steamered squares. Because in this case, we cannot use the Hopkins invariant. Okay, so let's go the dimension up. How about mappings from S5 to S4 with rank less than four? How about mapping from S6 to S5, etc. Right? So let's recall the, this was the question of Larry Goff that we don't know any non-trivial C1 metrics uh, between spheres with rank less than n. Okay? So in this case, the answer is yeah, no, no, and how about this case? And it turns out that in this case, there is a counterexample. In each dimension, when n is greater than or equal to 4, we can always find a C1 mapping with rank of the derivative less than n, which is not homotopic to a constant one. So, and then this is, I, I call um, the counterexample to the SART theorem because in this case, all values are critical and the function mapping must be surjective because otherwise it would be homotopy to a constant one. So, if all points are critical, it's surjective, so the measure of the uh, critical values is positive. And in addition, it has some this uh, topological uh, property of not being uh, uh, homotopic to a constant one. Okay, so let's put the, all the cases together. So when n equals two and three, mappings have to become a homotopic to a constant one. But in the dimensions four and higher, they there are counterexamples. Okay? So when n is two, this was by Hopf invariant. When n is three, this is the result of Larry Goof by Steenrod squares. And we have actually a simpler proof of this result using uh, certain generalization of the Hopf invariant. Okay, and in the dimension n greater than or equal to four, this is a new result, and it answers the question of Larry Goff that yes, there are such mappings. Okay, so this was this question. So okay, so this is this result. And what we find kind of surprising is that this uh, situation changes when n at n equals four. Because if you look at the homotopic groups of spheres, when n equals three, the fourth homotopy group is zito. When n equals four, the fifth homotopy group is zito. So somehow the groups are the same. However, the situation is completely different. Well, the, the groups are the same, but the, the topology of mappings from S4 to S3 and uh, S5 to S4 is very different. Okay. So what's so my the motivation? Map is always just the suspension of the half map. Isn't it? Uh, yes, this, uh, I mean, in, in the const construction, we, we, we use a half map uh, and uh, suspension. I won't talk about this. The, 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 <coughs> So what is my motivation? Because so the, the, those results about uh, results uh, for smooth mappings with derivative of low rank, right? Derivative of low rank. So my motivation came from the Heisenberg group because I work with the geometry of the Heisenberg group. So what is a Heisenberg group? It is Euclidean space R uh, two n plus one with a certain Lie group structure. In a certain metric, so called Carnot Caratodori metric. Okay? So one can view the Heisenberg group as a standard contact structure in R2 and plus 1. So this is basically the same. So this is basically 
the contact, uh, canonical contact structure or R2 and plus one equipped with a metric, canon characteristic metric. What is the metric? So basically, when I have two points, I take a curve connecting two points, and but I require the curve to be tangent to the contact distribution, and I measure the length of the curve. And the distance between two points is just an infimum of length of curves uh, tangent to the contact distribution that connect even two points. That's simple as that. But this metric is very strange. It has strange properties. Anyway, it is well known that when you have a mapping into the Heisenberg group, and we regard this as a mapping into R2 n plus 1, the rank of the derivative has to be less than or equal to n. So in the language of the contact geometry, I would say that uh, uh, if I have a Legendrian mapping, which is a mapping which which uh, maps standard space to the contact distribution, then the rank of the derivative of the Legendrian mapping is always less than or equal to n, or that the measure of the Legendrian submanifold in R2 and plus 1 is at most n. Okay, so, uh, and this is how I got interested in, in mappings with low rank, and actually, all our proofs that uh, we used, like this new proof in the case n equal 3 and the uh, new result in n equal 4 is based on the methods that have previously been used in study of the Lipschitz homotopy groups of the Heisenberg group. So like for example in this case, so this is a result of Larry Booth but we have a new simpler proof using the generalized Hopkins variant. So this is based on the generalized Hopkins variant that was introduced in that paper. Now, how about the case uh, n greater than or equal to 4, where we have this, um, counter -exa this example of a mapping with low rank, is based on, on a method uh, developed in that paper. So both papers are about the Lipschitz homotopy groups of the Heisenberg group, and surprisingly, they were published in the same volume. OK, uh, so. So let's look at this case n greater than equal 4. So that's the statement that there is a C1 mapping, which is not homotopic to a constant map, with rank of the derivative less than n. This is actually a very special case of a more general result. Okay, because why n plus 1 and n? There's no reason why to restrict to n plus 1 and n. So actually, we can construct mappings from n plus 1 dimensional sphere to k plus 1 dimensional sphere, which with the rank of the derivative less than or equal k, so which is <coughs> dimension minus 1, which are not homotopic to constant map, not provided m and uh, k satisfy certain condition. And when you take m equal n and k equal n minus 1, then this condition is equivalent to this one. Okay, so this is a special case. Okay, how to do this construction? I will, I will basically show you the proof. Of course, some details will be, I mean, a lot of details will be missing, but the main idea should be clear. So how to do? So first of all, so this was the assumption that this homotopy group is not true. That was the assumption. It turns out that this homotopy group, when you just lower the dimension by one, is also non-trivial. This is because under the given assumptions about M and K, the suspension homomorphism, suspension homomorphism is a surjection of the homotopy group. So if this is non-trivial, this cannot be trivial. Right? And this is the uh, uh, Freudental theorem. That's Freudental theorem. A classical Freudian transfer. That under the given condition for M uh, and K, this mapping is a surjection. So what we do? Well, we select a mapping. We, we know this is a non-zero. So we select a mapping which is not homotopic to a constant map. And then <clears throat> we can select a mapping such that uh, the suspension of this mapping is also not homotopic. Because this is a surjection, 
So you take a non-trivial element here, and this is a suspension of some map here. So we take a non-trivial element, such that uh, a suspension is non-trivial. What is a suspension? Suspension is defined the following way, that you, suspension is defined in the following way, that you uh, have a sphere, you have a sphere, on the equator, equator is marked to equator by the, by the mapping little h, by the mapping little h, okay? And how about this parallel? This parallel is mapped to the parallel by the same mapping h, but translated and scaled. So on each uh, sphere parallel to the equator, this is the same mapping h. I mean, scaled and translated. That is a suspension. Okay. So, okay, so these are the conditions. So, we have this mapping, which is a suspension of a non trivial map and not homotopic to a constant. And it suffices to find the extension. Look, this is the boundary of this bow. This is the boundary of that bow. So we have a mapping between boundaries. It suffices to extend this mapping to the whole balls in a way that rank of the derivative will be less than equal k. Why? Because if I can do this, then I can glue two copies of such uh, uh, balls. So this ball is deformorphic to the upper hemisphere of S n plus one. So you can glue two copies. In one copy, this will be a mapping between upper hemispheres, and the other will be a mapping between lower hemispheres. And this mapping will be not homotopic to a constant map. This again follows from the Freudian, Freudian theorem. And will have rank of the derivative less than or equal k, because this mapping has rank of the derivative of the k. And in the upper hem hemisphere and the lower hemisphere, this is the actual copy of the map. Okay, so it suffices to find the extension. But how to find the extension? Well, extension is easy to find, but how to guarantee this condition? Because this extension will be mapped onto entire ball. So somehow you think that if you have a mapping onto entire ball, which is positive k plus one dimensional measure, the rank should be k plus one somewhere. And it's possible to do that. How to do it? Okay, so now I will describe this extension. Okay, so I'm, I have a mapping from, I have a mapping from the sphere so I have a mapping from the sphere S uh, N to S K and I want to uh, extend this into the interior So first, inside this ball, inside this ball, because this is the boundary of the ball B M plus one. Right? Inside this ball, I select a lot of smaller balls. I don't say how many, a lot. Okay. In, 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 in our proof, we need some quantitative estimates how how many balls, and I don't like that they are somehow densely packed and disorganized, so let's organize them vertically. I can find the deformorphism of the ball, which is identical to the boundary, and puts the balls vertically. Well, there are a lot of balls, so when I put them vertically, they will probably have radius much smaller. Okay, then what do we have? Um, you do what you wish. What? You do what you wish. Yeah, but then I, uh, I do what I wish, but then I want to get what I want. So, and now, th this is an important step. So here, we have those vertical balls, right? Let's draw three balls. On and here, so. So those spheres is also n-dimensional and n-dimensional. And on each sphere, I take this mapping H. 
The same mapping as here, which is a suspension map, right? This is this, this map, suspension map. So this equator is mapped to this equator by the mapping little h. This is a suspension map. Each parallel is mapped here. The same with every sphere. The same here. And now it turns out that I can extend it to the complement of these balls. How do I extend it? I use simply cylindrical coordinates. On each sphere, on each sphere, each sphere is mapped to each sphere by the scale copy of H. So in each sphere centered at the vertical axis, this is the same map, little h. And, when, and then on each sphere will be suspension and here will be suspension, which means I can extend this map to a map which is defined on the complement of those spheres. So on the same ball minus those balls to this ball minus those balls. So that on each sphere, this is a mapping H, the suspension map, and on this is a suspension map. Do you have to have an odd number of balls? Uh, no, I don't know. I have many balls. More than three, more than four. More than 1,000. I have many balls. So the two balls. It doesn't matter how many balls. It can be with any, any number of balls. Because on each sphere, this is exactly the same mapping H. And you just ex use, extend it using cylindrical coordinates. Uh, that's an explicit formula. Okay, I don't like actually that those balls are vertical. I don't like that. So what I do, I rearrange those balls by diffeomorphism so they are inside some cubical grid. So here, look, those balls are large. I put them vertically so they are small. They are small, but then when I put inside the, the cubical grid, they are large. And what is important, that those balls are larger than those. You don't see that on the picture. Because the dimension of this ball is larger than the dimension of that ball. So those balls can be larger by some factor. OK, what to do next? What? No, they don't, they don't touch uh, this cubical grid. They don't touch. And don't touch each other. Don't. So now I have a mapping from the complement of those balls, complement of the balls, to the complement of those balls, right? To this gray area, which on the screen doesn't look great. And from this, I do the projection, a smooth projection from the complement of the balls onto the cubical grid. Smooth, C infinity smooth. Yeah. How that's possible, we have corners here. It's possible you somehow have to smooth out around the corners. It will not be a retraction. Right? If you have a smooth manifold and you have a retraction, the resulting object will be a smooth manifold. So this is not a retraction, it's a projection. So somehow the mapping, you have to squeeze it around the corners to make it smooth. And we want explicit formula how to do it. So again, you have a mapping which is defined on the ball, those, this ball, big ball, minus the union of the balls, on the complement of the balls, and this is mapped onto the bundle of this grid. So what is the fate of this, of this big sphere? This big sphere is mapped onto the big sphere, mapped onto the big sphere, mapped onto the big sphere, big sphere, big sphere, and big sphere is projected onto this big cube. What is the fate of a small sphere? What is the fate of the small sphere? This small, small sphere is mapped here, is mapped here, is mapped here, and it's projected onto this cube. Big sphere is projected onto the big cube. Small sphere is projected onto the small cube. And by smoothing and using homotopy, we can guarantee that the mapping on the big sphere is the same as the mapping on the small sphere. But scale is the same mapping. 
Then what, what we do? We iterate. Right? So that's the situation. Big sphere is mapped on, onto the boundary of the big cube. Each small sphere is mapped onto the boundary of each small cube. And we iterate because inside each small sphere, inside each small sphere, so this is a small sphere, this is a small sphere, inside the small sphere, we put a scaled copy of the same map. So this is the same map. So like this map maps the uh, ball onto such a grid. So this map will map this smaller ball onto such a grid in, inside this cube. So the complement of these 16 small balls will be mapped onto this grid. And we iterate infinitely many times. So what we get eventually, we, uh, we get a mapping which maps the ball onto the cube because the image of the ball will be continuous and uh, will contain the union of all such grids, so it so will be continuous and will contain a dense image. So it will be onto, and actually, it will be C1 smooth, not necessarily C2, it will be C1 smooth. So, so here, when we take the intersection of all balls and all scales, we have some residual counter set. And outside the counter set, the mapping is actually C infinity smooth. And it maps the complement of the counter set to such k-dimensional skeletons. If it maps to k-dimensional skeletons, that simply means that the rank of the derivative is less than or equal k on the complement of the counter set, right? Because it's a map to a k-dimensional <coughs> object. And this counter set, which is uh, of measure zero, uh, will be mapped on, on, on everything else. And derivative on the, on the counter set will be equal zero. So, and then, we get su such a, maybe, uh, actually, I don't like that this is a cube, because originally I wanted to have a mapping between uh, uh, balls. So let, let's smoothly change it into a ball. And of course, you have to go at the, there, there are a lot of technical problems. Like the suspension map that I described, it's not smooth. So you have to work with a smooth version of suspension. There are a lot of technical problems, but we took the purpose. So we constructed such a mapping, which is the extension of our previous mapping. We rank of the derivative, and we're done. Okay. So the question is, so that is what we proved. But our proof gives only the rank of the derivative is less than or equal to n minus one because our mapping was going to skeletons of co-dimension one. That was very essential. So the question is, if we can go below. And actually, there are some lower bonds. Uh, this is the re result of Larry Gu from the paper that I mentioned, that uh, when the rank of the, of the derivative is more or less less than half of the dimension, this is the integer part. Right? This is the integer part of a number. If the rank of the, the derivative is more or less less than half of the dimension, then the mapping must be homotopic to a constant map. Okay, like for example, in this uh, case uh, of, um, of uh, Kaufman map, here the mapping with rank of the derivative less than or equal to one, that always must be homotopic to a constant map. Okay? Okay, so this is a result of Larry Goof. And actually, so those, uh, this conjecture has not been published. I, I talked to him, and this is from the personal communication, that he believes that uh, actually a better result is, is true. That if rank of the derivative is even slightly more than that, then it's still homotopic. I say odd, why odd? Because when n is even, this number is equal to this, right? Two plus two over two is uh, two, integer part is two. Two plus three is five, 2.5 integer part two. So in even cases, it's the same. Uh, this is a theorem. But in odd cases, 
this is an open problem. And actually, he believes the, the estimate is sharp because he believes that if you have the same estimate but less than or equal to, then there is a counterexample. Okay. So, and actually, our example gives the answer to this when n equals 4, right? Because when n equals 4, sure, because 4 plus 3 is 7, 3.5, integer part 3. So where in the of the derivative is less than or equal to 3, and you have a mapping from S5 to S4, then you, you have a C1 extension, which is not homotopy to a constant. But in other cases, it's open. Actually, we could use this uh, <coughs> construction to solve another conjecture. So look, we have a mapping, C1 mapping, between Euclidean spaces of the same dimension. Okay? And the mapping. And we know that for some reason, the rank of the derivative of this mapping is less than equal k. And k is strictly less than dimension. Right? So when we have a C1 mapping, we like to approximate. We always like to approximate. We like to work with smooth mappings. So let's try to approximate. And we would like to approximate this mapping by smooth mappings so that the smooth mappings will still have the same rank condition. If you try to approximate the, uh, by convolution, that will not work. Because what does it mean that the rank of the derivative is less than or equal k? That means that every k plus 1 minor is 0, right? As derivative is determinant 0. But when you apply the convolution, a minor which is 0 can become non zero. So it's not clear how to approximate. But he conjectured this and. Uh, yeah, so he formulated this conjecture in this paper. So you said uniformly C0 or C1? What? Uniformly, uniformly uh, C0. C0. Uh, he asked actually about C1. But uh, we have a counterexample in C0. So, so it's even stronger. So, so OK, so the formulated in this case. Actually, uh, if you think about approximation locally, Maybe not a global, but in a neighborhood of a point, it's a very easy to. Okay, we, we have a counterexample, but okay, we have a counterexample in this in, in this paper, right? But if you think about local approximation, it's very easy to prove this result, that you can find an open and dense subset such that on this open and dense subset, a mapping can be approximated locally on both, actually in the C1 norm. So that the mappings converge uniformly and derivatives converge, open and dense. So the question is that there is still a knowing set which is closed and uh, nowhere dense. And the question is what happened on this set. Actually, this is a very simple example, the, the very simple result. So I extracted part of, part of this result about the open and dense set as an exercise and gave this to student on the preliminary exam, the students of the first year uh, entering our PhD program, and all of them failed. But it's still easy. It's an easy consequence of the rank theorem. It's it's one page long proof. It's it's easy. Okay, so this is the result, and we have a counterexample. So we can construct a mapping of class C1 from R5 to R5 with rank of the derivative to less than or equal free that cannot be approximated even locally, we, uh, we by C2 mappings with the same rank condition. Again, the previous results say that on the open and the dense set, you can do a local approximation. But we have this residual counter set where we cannot do the approximation locally. <coughs> now, C1 mappings from R7 to R7, rank of the derivative less than or equal 4. And you cannot approximate by mappings with this condition if they are of class C3. More generally, that's a result. If you have the same, uh, if you have the same condition between M and K as in, in the previous result, and you know that this homotopy group is not trivial, so the same assumption as before, and you have some K and L, then such mappings cannot be approximated by mappings of this class. Okay, there's this. So, so what I find interesting that some of, when you look at the problem, 
of the approximation doesn't look like a problem in algebraic topology. But somehow to find a counterexample, we need to use non-triviality of homotopy groups of spheres. Okay. What about uh, next, like pi seven, uh, S seven to S four? So uh, I, I don't remember. It depends on the home. You, you have to you check. Have a half yeah, you, you, you have uh, that, that, that that works. So you have to check. Uh, you have to check the homotopy group, whether the homotopy group is non-trivial, and then you have to check whether those conditions <coughs> are satisfied. So, so you have to check. I think if you have a rational invariant that's non-trivial, then the proof with the forms is still going to work. Okay. That, that's what we can prove. In other case, we can not prove. So there are a lot of cases. Like pi seven, pi seven of uh, S four. Yes. Then they're always homotopic to the constant. Then someplace after. Yeah, and, that, and then from this you can cook up the. the then exam. It's just after that, the suspension starts yeah. to become. Yeah. Uh, so then it's you can cook, cook up some examples. Yeah. But. Um, More questions? Comments? How about asking a question what is a generalized Hopkins variant? <laughs> Contra example? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> actually, the generalized Hopkins variant is defined that way. I mean, I still have five minutes, so. But okay, we are looking at mappings from S for n minus one into Rn. And m is greater or equal than two n plus one. In the classical hop invariant, we look at mappings into S to n. In the classical hop invariant, we look at the mappings into S to n. And now we look at the mappings n mappings into Euclidean space. Uh, you cannot have a copy invariant, any kind of invariant, because all such mappings are homotopic to the constant map. So, but then we define the invariant as follows. We take alpha n to n form on R n, n, smooth. We, then we they, uh, assume that then, okay, we assume, sorry, 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 We assume that, so F is Lipschitz, and all things C1, rank of the derivative <coughs> is less than or equal to N. That's our assumption. Rank of the derivative is less than to N. Like for example, in the case of the classical Hopkins invariant, the mapping is into the sphere, so the rank of the derivative is less than or equal to N. And then what we do? We take alpha is any 2n form on uh, any 2n form on Rn. Okay. How can I lift this up? It slides over. I'm trying to move the board. It's too complicated. Okay, so we have this uh, form, and then what we do that d star f star alpha, I mean d of f star alpha, is I claim that this is f star that d alpha is zero. Why? d alpha is not necessarily zero, it's any form. But d alpha is a 2n plus one form, right? Alpha was two and four. And rank of the derivative is less than or equal to n. So all uh, two n plus one, two n plus one minors are equal zero. Okay, so coefficients of the form are zero. If, since this is a closed form, it is exact. And we define generalized Hopkins variant. It's associated with this form of f, 
as the integral over s 4 n minus 1 of omega wedge d omega. The same formula as in the classical Hawking body, but now we have uh, mappings into the whole Euclidean space. In what sense this is a Hopf invariant? In the sense that if h 0, 1, s 4 n minus 1 into Rm is a homotopy between f and g and rank of the derivative is less than or equal to n, then h alpha f equals h alpha g. So we have a mapping into Rm. Of course, everything is homotopy, the constant one, but we put the condition on the rank. We assume that the rank of the, the mapping, rank of the derivative is less than or equal to n, and I'm looking only at the homotopy with the rank of the derivative less than or equal to n. And this is exactly what happens when you have a mappings into the sphere, because if you have a mappings into the sphere, rank of the derivative is less than or equal to n, to n, and the homotopy is also into this to n sphere, so the rank of the derivative of the homotopy is less than equal to n. Okay. Any more questions, comments, Contra examples? <laughs> if not, let's thank our speaker once more. <laughs> you, if you are interested, you will be dining with, the, with our speaker at the Bravo restaurant, go to the apartment at 5.45.